right, so his hands are free and his presentation is ready to go. Everyone, give it up for Chris. Hey. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Brousseau. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, test-driven development for data. I know all of you are 10Xers who test everything you need and first pass and you never have to kind of redo anything. I'm on the other side of the ledger a little bit. Um, what I wanted to talk about today, though, is that, that you can actually apply TDD to data engineering and data science and that kind of stuff. So it's not just all the good stuff about software. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, currently, I'm the founder of a company called Surface Owl. It's like personalized medicine for the enterprise. It's about transforming business operations and making complex decisions with AI and a visual map, right? So it's a visual decision-making tool for uh, executives to make their businesses run better. Uh, I also do some consulting as well. I recently did an AWS Big Data Cert course uh, with Pearson. And before all this, a recovering consultant with Accenture and engineering background, that kind of stuff, right? So uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm here because of this. I'm always the murderer who's finding myself. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where I like to minimize this. I can't do it enough. Um, and I thought you guys would enjoy this. Um, the problem to solve here, though, at the end of the day is like, you know, it's easy to get bogged down when you're doing data engineering and science and looking at stuff. It's easy to get caught up in the code and start coding right away. So this is about finding ways to kind of speed that up and do it more objectively and a little bit less painfully. We're going to talk about kind of like two cases, though, okay? So as you all know, in every data science tutorial, when you encounter data you don't like, you just drop NA or just get rid of it. But that's not always the case. So we're going to solve for kind of two common cases. The first is, is when you have tidy data, which refers to kind of data in a grid where each column is a variable and each row is an observation. It's all there in an organizational form. That's not the same as saying it's clean. There can be missing columns. There can be bad data, all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of case one. We get a lot of that kind of stuff through our pipelines. And then case two is also interesting where you have data that's not structured and you've got to kind of pull some logic and structure out of this mess and put it into some tidy format or some other uh, method, right? And so we're going to talk about both of those um, in this chat. And our objectives are we're going to just do a little intro on TDD because I don't know everyone's background. I know people know testing, but we'll talk a little about what that is. We're going to talk about two specific packages, PyTest I'm a big fan of, and then Dataset, which is actually on top of PyTest for data, and then we'll highlight on a couple of uh, times when you, when you um, may not want to use TDD, okay? So at the end of the day, this is really why we want to apply this to our data engineering. Uh, you know, you make some function, you make some other function, you break the first function, this kind of can be an infinite loop. So TDD is about, like, let's put some guardrails in so we don't break the stuff that was working yesterday. And it works like this. Um, you know, it's a process, and the big themes are that everything's really intentional. It's designed to kind of start small and be explicit. And then most importantly, it's also designed to be automated, right? So when you run tests, you kind of put them in the bank, and those tests run every time. You do commits and things like that, so you don't break things, and you can have confidence that you've still got working code in other areas, okay? Uh, it works in the inverse uh, of most kind of coding practices. A lot of us like to, I myself, guilty of this, jump in and start kind of writing the answer, you know? Uh, this is a process where you step back and say, you know, really objectively, what are my requirements and what are the outcomes that I can measure? And then I write a test for that before I even kind of do anything. And that then makes me go write the code to pass that test. And this forces you to kind of do the outcome first and then the code. And you refactor this and automate it. That's kind of the general flight plan for software engineering. Why do you do this? Focus on requirements, saves you time. At the end of the day, that's, I think, really what most of us care about. I also like a couple of other things on this list that are interesting, boosting confidence in the code. It feels good when your tests are green and someone asks you, is this going to work in production? And you can say, absolutely, at least until it doesn't, right? Um, the other thing I thought was kind of neat was uh, when you're onboarding new people onto your team, you know, if they want to understand what's going on, of course they're going to read every statement in every module and dig into it. Um, but they also might want to just look at requirements and doc strings and tests. And tests are a super useful way to just get that intuition about kind of what's going on. And this is also good for data. So first package we'll talk about, PyTest. Okay, PyTest replicates a lot of the stuff that's in unit test. It's a PyPy package. 
I think it's pretty cool. Um, it does auto discovery, much like unit test does. It also runs unit test stuff. And I think the syntax in this library is a bit cleaner in the sense that it's, there's not this camel casey stuff. And also you write tests as functions, not classes. So it's just a little bit quicker to do. Uh, there's also this huge universe of useful plugins. There's also a good fraction of those that are not like super useful and not maintained, but a lot of good ones like AWS and Selenium and databases. And there's a link here that I'm not gonna click out to that gives like a first pass on how to use this library in an intuitive way. I think sometimes the documents get like a little bit opaque. So when you look at something that is this GitHub guy's GitHub link, it's like, oh yeah, sure. That's quickly a good quick reference uh, place to go. Now data test sits on top of PyTest. And this is really about formalizing uh, and only working on data, and it's good for putting in pipelines. In this uh, presentation, which by the way, I'm using RISE, we're gonna try to use this other little package I found called IPyTest that lets you run tests from within Jupyter Notebook. Not fully stable, thus the delay in me starting. So, you know, uh, we may have to abandon ship and jump over to PyCharm. So, let's talk a little bit about um, data test. Data test does kind of like three things. It does validation, does some error reporting like all good test frameworks, and also it does things called acceptances. Now in software engineering, you kind of control the whole universe there, so you can write exceptions, and you can say this is what passes and this is what doesn't. When you're doing data engineering, you don't always know what's gonna come to you, and sometimes you can't get perfection, you can't demand perfection, but you can kind of put some boundaries on that. So as an example, is it okay if we have 95% populated content in this column? Is 5% missing data okay? If not, what do we do, right? Um, it works with pandas, et cetera. The three main functions are worth looking at. The validation function is the obvious one, right? Uh, hey, I'm expecting this tidy data to have a bunch of columns. You know, first off, are they even there? Uh, is the content in those columns what I'm expecting? Is it the right type? Uh, what's the range of values? Are there specific values that I'm looking for? All that kind of stuff. It's got some cool things around matching and sequences that you can use, and also some fuzzy logic. The next thing that's also interesting, it's a little bit different, is that you know, as you have new data flowing through, you can compute differences between kind of your base case and the expected case, and you can use that to make decisions. And that's what this third thing is. So you can use PyTest to help figure out, do I let this data through my pipeline? Is it close enough to run? You know, uh, is it close enough to do um, this analysis that I want? Or do I have to go do some more cleanup before I go do my fancy uh, matplotlib plotting? Yes? Are you running data tests inside, in, in like, importing data and things like that, or just when you're running the tests? Yeah, you're, you're, you're running data through it, and we'll look at a little bit of that. So you can do this in standalone development environments, you can do this in notebooks, you can do it in pipelines, right? Good question. Other questions? Okay. Um, the acceptances are interesting, because there's a lot of flexibility there. The docs are pretty clear on how it works, but you can do things like, absolutely, it's gotta have this stuff. You can have tolerances, you can have percentages. Um, you can also compose these and kind of add them up. So it can say, hey, these three columns have to be in the data, and this third column has to be 100% complete no matter what. You know, things like that are super powerful, and we'll see it in action in a little bit. Let's look at uh, a data case. So here is, a test case. It's actually not using PyTest because I wanted to try out Moshe's little test runner he gave me a link to, so I'm shamelessly stealing this from him. And I'll show you a little bit about what this data looks like. Uh, I'm sorry it's so small, I'm not sure I can probably zoom in a little bit here. But this is just a little data frame of movies and the ratings and things like that, right? So very straightforward stuff. Um, here's how you use data test, right? So we write some classes and functions and we're gonna do a test on, hey, does this content have these four columns? Uh, the title column, are the words capitalized? The ratings, here are the ratings I expect. So as long as it passes these things, we're good to go, okay? So we define these things, and surprise, surprise, the tests fail. Moshe promised me this was a good thing, to have my test fail during a talk, so I'm gonna take him at his word. Here's why I think this is useful, though. Unlike in Pandas, where maybe this is buried in an ocean of data, here I can see, look, 
I've got an error log. There's a couple of differences in a very specific place, so it's actionable. I can go work on it. I can fix the input data. I can maybe adapt a function or a class to clean that up as it's kind of going through the pipeline. I see another problem down here. Hey, we're supposed to have some capitalization. It does not have the capitalization. Why is that? Let's go look and see the source data. There you go. We've got these things that, you know, if this is buried in like some 50,000 row uh, table, I'm, I'm just not gonna see that kind of stuff. But here I can act on it and I can also decide, is it worth acting on it? If there's only two of these things, you know, maybe that's a tolerance I can kind of live with, right? All right, so let's go do a little bit of cleanup here. Voila, we've gone and cleaned up the data. I've got another test that's gonna look at this now corrected ratings, which I don't know if Kulha and Luke is PG-13 or not, but uh, we'll let that go. Skip this cell, this is just a Jupyter notebook uh, state management issue. And we rerun these tests that we just ran two seconds ago and they all pass, right? So voila, so now we've all seen kind of how data test works like in this case. It is kind of neat, you can do this in a notebook, but it's actually more powerful when you're in your IDE and you're working on kind of building functions around a pipeline and things like that, right? Uh, you can run them and run them and see them and, and, and in real time kind of make these adjustments. Uh, any questions about data test? No? All right. Uh, let's go on to section two, which is uh, uh, talking about the second case, right? So this is where we have this messy, unstructured data. Uh, we're going to go find some URLs in Excel and do a bunch of regex and stuff like that. By the way, I'll just punch out to this site for those of you who don't know this site. This is great. We'll flip back to it in a second. Um, the problem statement that I was solving for is a bunch of entities and PDFs. They're all different formats. I ended up not wanting to deal with that because processing one PDF is like a nightmare and would take a day, uh, and I had thousands of them. So there's a service I used that processed them into Excel, and now at least it's all in something that I can access programmatically and importantly use the metadata in the Excel to do the parsing. So the logic behind this got a little squirrely, but at least it was kind of manageable, right? And it was schools, and the schools were organized in a very messy way. You probably can't read this here, but I'll give you the link to the GitHub repo. It's like this school is a school and an address and a name and phone numbers in there buried as a URL. This one has address all bundled with the name. Some of them have italics, some of them are blue, etc. Needed the stuff, didn't want to process it by hand, so we wrote some code to go dig this up for us. And one of the things that we started to do was write code to process. We got a bunch of data, we thought it was pretty good. But then when we started looking at an aggregate, we were missing a lot of things. So we had to go back, do our TDD, and say, okay, how do we know? Our URL retrieving functions actually getting a URL, right? So this is a classic case of using PyTest. I'm gonna write this test. It's gonna find a URL somewhere in this string, and I'm gonna assert that there's a URL in this string and it's equal to this thing, right? See if this even works. <coughs> Shift Enter. Execute. All right, that's not really working. So I'm going to flip over here and show you what it looks like. Let's run this puppy. Okay. So this runs and this fails because I have a module not found error. So we're gonna skip this part of the demo because I'm not dealing with that while I'm up here. But the case is that, you know, you've written these functions, of course, during a live demo, right? Um, and you can use this test-driven development process to kind of iterate through your functions and your regexes and make sure that things are passing. At the end of the day, what we would do is go through and find that our first fancy URL that just looks for three W's at the front doesn't work. We'd iterate through that site, look at some other resources like Regex 101, help find a better Regex that helps kind of make all of those tests pass. Okay, there's a bunch of tests. I'm not gonna run that one. Uh, you can then extend this idea, okay? So we've got one working. Uh, we would go through and add other inputs that we've discovered that are maybe kind of the most common cases that we discovered while we were manually exploring our data. We say, hey, we're seeing lots of things like this and lots of things like this. We write another test, et cetera. Run this, if our code passes and doesn't break the first test, we're good to go. And this continues, and you can continue extending uh, your uh, logic to build this up and making sure that all of your previous material still works. So 
That's what we did to go find a bunch of URLs. The next case that we would go look at was to go look at summaries for addresses, same kind of idea, but applying more logic to go get the individual names out of here, which is, again, a whole project that we're not gonna do. But what I wanted to show you was this method. Okay, I don't wanna show you another test that goes and looks up some stuff. This method actually turned out to be a huge time saver for us. It is trivial for you and I to look at this list and go, okay, in this document, on this tab, there's one, two, three, four, there's three schools here, right? And I can quickly kind of get that documented. And I could go write a whole bunch of tests kind of tab by tab and write up a gigabyte of tests, et cetera. But what we decided to do was aggregate that stuff in a summary table that would just allow us to manually look. It's also something people can QC independently. Hey, you know, Carmen, Cameron found five tests on this tab, did Chris find the same number there? And then we use this as an input to our test suite so that it would just go through and say, okay, I'm looking at such and such a document, I'm looking at such and such a tab, how many tests should I find? So it's an easy way to parameterize stuff, but by keeping the data that's driving your tests in that gold standard and also keeping it close to the data so you can check it. When we first started doing some of this, we were writing tests in PyCharm, but then it was disconnected, so there's a lot of back and forth, and that turned out to be kind of a big time suck, so I don't recommend it. This is a super good strategy for kind of detecting and bounding your edge cases when you have messy data. All right, um, and this is how it's implemented. Simple example, this is the test that we wrote. Uh, actually, we wrote a bunch of these, but it was a simple copy and paste where all we're doing is kind of saying, hey, go look at this document, go look at this tab. We've already got the reference material. We don't have to do them all. We can do them as we go. And as we went through, we would find out results like this. You know, we'd march through this array, catching our edge cases automatically instead of realizing we're missing data in our plot or we're missing data in our summaries. This particular thing that somebody's expecting wasn't there. So this was super useful for us to kind of mechanically kind of march through and build up our uh, functions to capture things in a way that was structured and efficient and it really helped us save a lot of time. So as a strategy, I recommend that when you're trying to kind of trap for those unique edge cases. So this sounds great, Chris. How do I do more TDD for data? I should use it everywhere, right? Absolutely not. No, there's definitely places and times where you do not want to do it because it is more work up front to kind of write these things. So when you're doing EDA and prototypes and stuff like that, definitely not. Uh, I've also found that when you have managed sources, well-managed sources that are reliable, etc., cetera, um, you can write minimal tests, more kind of completeness and error kind of stuff. But just as in software engineering where it's easy to get carried away kind of writing tests that look like it's creating value but really don't prove anything useful, it's easy to fall into that trap when you're doing this on data as well. And my acid rule is really kind of a cost-benefit kind of ratio. If I'm going to save a lot of time, then sure, we can write a test and kind of trap for it. But if I'm not, if it's a one-time thing, then we kind of pass on it. Um, general rule of thumb. So that is the story. There's a bunch of resources here. Here's this talk. Uh, this stuff generally runs when you have a working environment. Um, and some links to both the docs and uh, things like that for all of these different things. I'd also note that probably over like the last like six months, there's been a little bit of an uptick in people writing about this topic. I don't know, I hadn't seen that really before last year, but now I'm seeing a few articles out there and stuff. So people are starting to recognize the value. And I would say that you know if you have any data science kind of friends out there, definitely point them to this because it's not something that I think naturally people like us jump into and say, yes, let's go kind of build testing. Uh, we're more kind of explore and discover and build some new you know, predictive things. This kind of seems like, ah, oh, that seems hard, uh, but it's super worthwhile. It's super worthwhile for a lot of reasons, mainly saving our own time so we can go work on stuff that we like to do. So that is the story on the talk. Um, recapping our objectives, I think we kind of covered everything. We talked about do testing in uh, tidy data and, uh, and doing it in data engineering. We got some links and stuff like that. So I'll just open it up. If there are any questions or anything I glossed over I should revisit, let me know. All right. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> questions about testing for data. I like data tests. I met the guy who wrote data tests at PyCon a couple of years ago, Sean Brown. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, I see it picking up some steam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, he was a little bit ahead of his time. Uh, yeah. But, like, 
it can save you a lot of time, especially as the data grows and like, you know, people, I mean, there's like a whole new set of people you have to teach about CI, mm -hmm. right? Um, so maybe we can have you back and talk about, you know, CI for data as well. Yeah. In the meantime, questions for Chris? You can talk to him after. All right. All right. Great. Thank you very <laughs> okay, much. Thank you, Chris.